Members of Sydney Dance Group 101 Doll Squadron report for duty. At last weekend's formal commissioning of the Navy's newest warship, their energetic performance raising more than just eyebrows inside the military. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And as stories go, that one started innocently enough, with Australia's military inviting a group of dancers to help commission a new billion-dollar naval ship in Sydney last weekend. The video was then tweeted by the ABC's defence correspondent, Andrew Green, and was a smash hit, clocking up almost a million views. So, is it any surprise that come next day, the story of the top brass, the shiny warship and the saucy dance troupe was shaking the nation? Navy's new twerk ethic. The Navy is facing a mutiny of sorts over why a troop of scantily clad twerkers were deployed to the opening of a naval ship. And naturally, the Telegraph's headline writers went overboard with the puns. Navy in rear, Admiral Saga. Anchors were hey. It's naval warfare. 21 bun salute. Shake your body. But it wasn't just the telly that went wild over the 101 doll squadron dancers, who are Willamaloo locals where the Navy is based. I love this country. <laughs> <laughs> Today's Sydney reporter Gabriel Boyle is following the fallout. Gabby, this was not your normal <laughs> naval event. And even the nine political editor was strutting his moves. Go. Oh, oh God, I've got to stand on the like... chair. Oh, there you go. Oh, Whoa. he's got there. And where did everyone get their footage? From the national broadcaster, of course, which showed a bemused Defence Chief Angus Campbell sitting through the naval display. So, too, the Governor General, David Hurley, and the Chief of Navy, Mike Noonan. But were all the top brass actually there, watching the dancers? Answer, no. Issuing a statement, the Department of Defence made clear... The dance was performed prior to the arrival of His Excellency the Governor-General, Chief of Navy and Commander Australian Fleet. And a statement from the Governor-General, read out here by Sky's Andrew Clonell, also confirmed this. The performance occurred before the Governor-General arrived. The presentation of the video to suggest otherwise was disappointing. Whoops. So, were any of those dignitaries there and watching? Answer, yes. Defence Chief Angus Campbell certainly was, along with other members of the military. So, did an ABC journalist or editor just get mixed up about who was watching and who was not? Who knows? But the video has now been recut to take out the Governor-General and others who were not there for the performance. And the ABC has apologised, adding... The video should not have been edited in that way. No kidding. And if you look at the raw footage, which an editor must have done, it's obvious the Chief of Navy and the Governor-General were never watching the dancers. Because they arrive well after the dance is finished. And that shot of the Governor-General on the chair looking attentive shows quite clearly he's listening to official proceedings at the time, with no music to be heard. Same goes for the Navy Chief. All in all, a bad look for Auntie, as the PM pointed out. To suggest there were the Governor-General or others were in attendance there in that way, I, I think was very dishonest. And to add insult to injury, the ABC even copped a serve from the dancers themselves, who released a statement slamming what they called the ABC's deceptive editing and naughty camera work. We found this very creepy and reflects more on the ABC's camera operator and their need to sexualise these women and their dance piece for their own gratification. Hmm, that seems a bit harsh. But by now, everyone was having a go, including the telly, which, after its double page of sexualised puns the day before, had the gall to add this condemnation. ABC Twerk Tweak Creepy. So, was the ABC deliberately deceitful, as some critics suggest? We reckon it was a cock-up, not a conspiracy. A stupid, sloppy mistake that could easily have been avoided. But now, to the bombshell in the backyard of the high-profile Seven executive and one-time war hero. Tonight, we reveal startling new information that will shock the nation. It's about Robert Smith's efforts to conceal evidence and threaten witnesses who dared to stand up to him. For more than three years, Ben Robert Smith has been dogged by allegations of war crimes that are now subject to multiple police and military inquiries. The former soldier denies all claims against him, but last Sunday, Nine's Nick McKenzie used 60 Minutes to drop another bomb, revealing shocking photos of obscene acts by some SAS soldiers including a Ku Klux Klan outfit at a celebration on base. Plus, the corpses of dead Afghanis interfered with in battle, along with new allegations that Robert Smith organised letters and text messages to intimidate witnesses and allegedly, literally, burying evidence. 
There's a bizarre opening scene to this story of national shame. A backyard in Queensland's Sunshine Coast and a child's pink lunchbox filled with computer USBs containing graphic evidence of appalling conduct. A former soldier digs a hole and buries his secrets. The buried lunchbox was an attempt at a cover-up, Mackenzie claimed, and it raised, quote, questions about whether Ben Robert Smith has sought to undermine Australia's justice system. And if he has, why he's gotten away with it. Mackenzie's latest blockbuster doubled the stakes in a battle to be decided in the federal court in June, when Media Titans 7 and 9 will square off against each other with millions of dollars and reputations on the line. Robert Smith, who's now Managing Director of Seven West Media's Queensland operations, was denied the opportunity by 60 Minutes to respond in the program. But next day, Seven News had him hitting back and denying all the allegations. In a statement, the Channel 7 executive said last night's 60 Minutes story was a means of intimidating him into not proceeding with a defamation claim against the Nine Network. He said the allegations are not supported by evidence Seven and its Perth-based newspaper, The West Australian, did report the allegations, but both framed the story in terms of Robert Smith's fierce denials. While on Nine, Nick McKenzie raised the stakes again, telling today... All through this scandal, Ben Robert Smith has said publicly he's supporting the authorities who are investigating him actively. Uh, that's, we now know that is a, a lie. Uh, he deliberately, uh, with absolute intent, sought to conceal evidence. McKenzie has been investigating Robert Smith for years and first accused the VC winner of breaching the rules of war in August 2018 in a story written with David Rowe and former Four Corners reporter Chris Masters, alleging... ..bullying, intimidation and his involvement in small SAS teams suspected of the abuse of unarmed civilians and the use of force that goes well beyond what is acceptable in the theatre of war. Not surprisingly, Robert Smith sued for defamation. And as 60 Minutes revealed last week in this secret recording, vowed to get even. Now I'm going to do everything I can to destroy them. Yeah. All I do is that's my sole fucking mission in life. Robert Smith is not just relying on Seven's support in this, he's also being bankrolled by his employer, as he bluntly admitted on tape. Kerry is Kerry Stokes, war buff, billionaire owner of Seven West Media and Ben Robert Smith's biggest supporter. Not only has Stokes kept Robert Smith on the payroll as a senior executive, he's dug into his own pocket to fund his defence. Nine reported last week that $1.87 million of Seven's money had been loaned via Stokes to Robert Smith to pay for his private legal expenses, while Nine reportedly faces a bill of $3 million to defend the case. So, can Nine defend its reporting? And will Mackenzie's dramatic new claims help or hinder their case? Nine will plead truth as its primary defence and in a key decision earlier this month won the right to beam witnesses in from Afghanistan. Four Afghan nationals who allegedly witnessed an incident in which a man was said to have been kicked off a cliff and shot dead by Australian soldiers will be allowed to give evidence from overseas in the defamation trial brought by SAS veteran Ben Roberts Smith. But Nine may have to fight to get all its new evidence admitted. University of Western Australia Law School lecturer Michael Douglas told us... There may be yet another interlocutory squabble over the admissibility of the new material and how it should be treated in light of its national security significance. Meanwhile, lawyer Michael Bradley says Robert Smith could claim further reputational damage from the new reports and use them as evidence of malice to support a demand for aggravated damages. It's two-edged for everyone, but in the end, the whole case will boil down to a single question. Does Nine have the evidence to prove, on the balance of probabilities, that Robert Smith murdered Afghan civilians? Everything else is theatre. Theatre and pride, as Michael Douglas says... The stakes are high. Apart from money, each side seems to have a lot of pride on the line. Emotional cases like this by lawyers, their holiday houses. Robert Smith also has the task of winning back his staff. In another of those taped conversations, the former soldier gave a scathing assessment of fellow seven executives. No one knows how to f plan in Sydney. These are the people that are running this business. They don't know how to plan. There are some really good people that I've worked with, just not many of them above me. Robert Smith has apologised to Seven staff for those comments and, somewhat remarkably, Seven's Kerry Stokes has continued to stand by him, as he's done from day one. So, Seven is sticking by its man and Nine is standing by its stories.
The blockbuster legal battle begins in early June. But now to a familiar theme in the tabloids and the push to cancel an Australian icon because the name is offensive, aimed this time at Australia's favourite party treat. Fairy bread is the latest snack to come under the cancel culture spotlight, with a new change.org campaign declaring that the term fairy has been used to belittle and oppress others. From now on, the change.org campaign suggests we should all be calling it party bread, as the New Zealand Herald reported, for the sake of countless marginalised Australians. And thus did the fuss begin, with FM radio presenters around the country picking up the headlines and pressing the outrage button. I think now the, the world has officially gone mad if it hasn't done so already. You're kidding me, right? What, aren't the kids allowed to fantasise anymore? The world's gone mad. Bonkers. That was Southern WA, and in Perth the reaction was much the same. Nah, ridiculous. Strong. Let's just Stronger. relax, <laughs> be happy. I've had fairy bread from the day I was born. Yeah. Don't mind it. ABC Darwin was also joining the pylon with breakfast listeners reaching for their party forks. Tech says, uh, who can be offended by this and who identifies as a fairy? Members of change.org, please get a life. Another says, totally ridiculous. Rename fairy bread, how pathetic. Get real and do something constructive. And arriving late to the pity party was 3AW's drive host, Tom Elliott. Cancel culture. It is real. It is in our lives. It is stupid, but that doesn't mean it's not here. But was the push to cancel fairy bread ever serious enough to merit such outrage? Well, no, because if you bothered to do 10 seconds of research before joining the pylon, you would have heard the alarm. First, the petition was started by a woman called Alexis Shays, who claimed to be a self-made activist, gym trainer, homeopath with a background in chiropractic, who, despite what people say, was not fired from her job. Yes, seriously. And a quick check of her Facebook profile would have showed she's a saleswoman at a furniture store who has only six Facebook friends and believes pasta is murder. And if you then Googled her name, you'd have found that Alexis Shays is a type of sofa, which is why Matt Johnson at 10 News First tweeted, Come on, news.com.au. This didn't require much work to fact check. Unsurprisingly, the news.com.au story has now been taken down and their shame has been buried. But if they'd tuned into 2GB nine days earlier, they could have saved themselves all the embarrassment because Ms Shays was roundly sat upon by 2GB's Ben Fordham. I'm pretty sure Alexis Chase is a type of couch, so I'm doubtful our next guest is who she says she is. But we will proceed. Alexis Chase, PhD. Good morning. Hello, Ben. I don't appreciate the way I've been spoken about just then. It's a scam, Alexis. <laughs> I noticed the first four people to follow you on Twitter are the Chaser Boys, Craig Rucastle, James Jules Morrow, Dom Knight and the Chaser account. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> yes, good friends of mine. A little bit speechless, are we, Alexis? So, well done, Ben, for your fine detective work in uncovering the prank. Shame that fairy bread correspondents at other media outlets clearly don't tune in to Sydney's top-rating breakfast show. And that includes Ben's colleagues at uh, 3AW. And finally, to more serious matters, with the US media in the crossfire after Minnesota police shoot another unarmed black man. An officer shouts, warns she'll tase him. But she fires a shot from her gun instead. The killing of Dante Wright has seen Minnesota's main police centre besieged by protesters. We have National Guard and Brooklyn Center Police pushing back hundreds of protesters block by block. Debris is being thrown right now. And they're moving them out. They're moving them out. And with crowds fighting tear gas with fireworks, the media has found itself stuck in the middle, copying pepper spray, beating with batons, forcible arrest, and rubber bullets from the police, like this video cameraman. Which left Star Tribune's Mark Van Cleve with a badly broken finger. Or they've been getting on the wrong end of abuse from the protesters. Now you can, can see. see y'all be twisting up the story. You want to talk to me? Do you want to talk yep. to me? Okay, cool. Talk. Don't take my mic, I'll but talk. we're cool. I'll okay. Talk. Go what ahead. Is your, what's your name? What's my name? My name is my name. That is Sarah Sidner from CNN, who's been a reporter for 25 years, doing her best to speak to locals. But try as she might, they did not want to know. Talk about something that's real. Tell me what's real. Y'all just gonna edit out the shit. That we're don't live. Want, we and are then live. And y'all gonna Listen, edit out some other shit. We're live. Right we're now. not fucking live. I'm live right now. I don't care if you're live or not. 
But Sidna, who took it all in her stride and said it was OK for people to question her, got off lightly. Here's NBC's Ron Allen playing mediator on live TV. Cross the street that have nothing to do with nothing. I'm going to go, but report all day, NBC. OK, OK, take it easy, OK. All right, folks, folks, easy, OK? We want to tell the world what's going on out here, OK? We know everybody's angry. How's that for Grace under fire? Although it was all too much for the folks back at HQ. They want fucking peace! And then they get we're gonna... We're just going to cut in because we have a responsibility in terms of the language, and I'm sorry to have to cut in. Trust in the US media has been declining for decades, and what those clips show is even black reporters from sympathetic US networks get no free pass. A recent University of Texas survey found that black Americans did not trust journalists to tell their stories and felt coverage of their communities lacked context and was one-sided and incomplete. Scary for frontline reporters, worrying for all of America. That's it from us tonight. There's more on our website where you can stream or download the program. And don't forget Media Bytes, Thursdays on social media and iview. But for now, until next week, goodbye.